is Good Friday. And this whole week in the story of Jesus' life has been a busy one. Saturday night was the night that he was anointed at Bethany by Mary. That's when Judas got all upset. Remember that? He said, why was this not sold and the money given to poor, the poor? And Jesus called him out and she had anointed him, he said, for his burial. Sunday was Palm Sunday. Jesus rode into Jerusalem and they sang Hosanna and waved the palm branches. Monday came in. He came in and cleansed the temple turned the tables over, drove the money changers out. Tuesday, they said, we got to do something about this guy. So the Pharisees and Sadducees and scribes began sending people to ask him tricky questions to get him in trouble. And he disputed with them all day long until it says that nobody else would dare ask him a question. Wednesday is the day that Jesus gave that all of it discourse where he told what was going to happen when they were admiring the temple and Jesus said, not one of these stones will remain standing upon one another. Thursday night was the night of the Last Supper where they broke bread and they shared in the cup together and the communion service was instituted. And that night, Jesus was arrested and he was brought before first Annas and Caiaphas, the high priests, and then to Pilate and then back to Herod and then back to Pilate. And then he was sentenced to die on that good Friday. And we're going to pick up the story at verse 32 of Luke chapter 23. It's amazing the contrast between Sunday and Friday, isn't it? They welcomed him as king, but when they saw what the king wanted to do with that authority, they revoked it, which they had no right to do, but it was all in God's plan. So let's read verse 32, and we'll go down to verse 43. Two others who were criminals, were led away to be put to death with him. And when, to they, when they came to the place that is called the skull, there they crucified him. And the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. And Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they cast lots to divide his garments. And the people stood by watching, but the rulers scoffed at him, saying, He saved others. Let him save himself, if he is the Christ of God, the chosen one. The soldiers also mocked him, coming up and offering him sour wine and saying, If you're the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was also an inscription over him, This is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who were hanged railed at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other rebuked him, saying, Do you not fear God, since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we are receiving the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And he said to him, truly I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. So here we see Jesus, the one that they had heralded as king, not a week before, led to die on Mount Calvary like a common criminal. Calvary means the place of the skull. Also, Golgotha in another language. They all mean the same thing, the place of the skull. After three years of miracles, opening the eyes of the blind, raising up the lame, years of teachings of righteousness, he said, love your enemies, bless those who curse you. After three years of showing love to those who did not receive it from anywhere else, he would be crucified on a Roman cross. His arms would be stretched out. His feet would be stretched out. He would be nailed to the posts and then raised up where he would hang until he asphyxiated. And we see in this passage and also in our own hearts the unfairness of this all. It's so unfair. This Jesus and everything that he did is the one hanging from the cross while these reprobate Pharisees and Sadducees and priests are railing at him and mocking at him from safety down below. The thief had it right when he said, we are suffering justly, but this man has done nothing wrong. Matthew 27, 18 says that the reason the Jews turned him over to be crucified was because of envy. And Pilate, the Roman official, allowed him to be crucified even though he knew he had done nothing wrong because of cowardice. He should have taken that righteous stand and said no. But he bowed to the whims of this envious group of people. 
They did not like the fact that people were following after Jesus instead of after them. So there's no point in blaming the Jews alone for the death of Jesus or the Romans alone for the death of Jesus because every single one of them was involved. And you know the Romans and the Jews in this story, they are a stand-in for you and for me. These are not unique people. This was not some wicked generation that was just the right generation to crucify Jesus. Every one of us has a fountain of sin bubbling up in our hearts. Those same sins that drove them to put Jesus on that cross. Envy. Are you not envious? Cowardice. Have you not been cowardly and backed off when you know you should have taken a stand? We're full of lust. We're full of gluttony. We're full of rage. But all of those things don't come from outside of us. They come from inside. You take a little child. You do not have to teach him to be wicked. He knows that all on his own. We all know that. Romans 3.23 tells us that all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Jeremiah 17.9 says that the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately sick. Who can understand it? The standard is God's glory, Romans said, and none of us have reached it. And just in case you might be able to deceive yourself and say, I'm not that bad, Jeremiah reminds us, you are no fit judge for yourself because it is your heart that is sick and wicked. So the sick patient that says, I'm fine, I can leave this hospital, is not a fit judge for himself. Neither are you. Every man who is descended from Adam is a sinner. And I guess that's all of us. And it was that sin that put Jesus on the cross. We love to think high thoughts about ourselves that if God were to appear to me, I would do everything he said. The atheists love to tout this and say, well, if God would just show himself, then we'd be happy to believe in him. It's a lie because God did and they nailed him to the cross and we are no different than they are. Well, I wasn't there. No, but would you have done any different? You know you would not have. Do you not live that way now? You try your best to stamp out the testimony of God in your life. When the light shines on you and shows you where you're wrong, don't you do your entire best to wriggle out from underneath it? When someone comes at you and tells you what you're doing is not right, rather than say, perhaps they're right, you fly out at them and say, how dare you try to judge me? We see this all across the nation, all around the world. Anyone that dares speak of what is right or what is wrong gets blasted from all sides as the world tries to stamp out the light of God. Is there any greater crime than that? That when God speaks and we choose to destroy it. But in the midst of all this, they're reviling Jesus. It's not enough that he's hanging on the cross. This is what every depiction of it gets wrong. In every depiction, and this is all fine, the music is playing and Mary is weeping and it all is so sad. This would have been a boisterous, unseemly situation. There would have been a bunch of men at the bottom laughing and mocking and making lewd jokes at Christ's expense. And they're gambling for his clothing. Who gets his coat? Who gets his jacket? Who gets his sandals? But in the midst of all that, we see this thief hanging on the cross next to Jesus. And this humble man rebukes the other thief and says, don't you fear God? You're about to face eternity and you stand here reviling this righteous man. And he says, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus says, today you will be with me in paradise. Now, as nice as this story is, this isn't really fair either, is it? Why should this man receive mercy from Jesus? He had been duly tried and convicted, and even while he's facing his death penalty, he admits that he deserved what he was getting. So why should he, of all people, receive mercy? Because look at what Jesus says in verse 34. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. This is why God sent his son Jesus in the first place. That he might pardon those whose sin put him on that cross. 
Those were the ones that needed help, and so those are the ones that Jesus was sent to help, knowing full well that they would nail him to that tree. And this act that we see of Jesus pardoning the thief on the cross is in miniature what God desires to do for all of us. To say, surely this day you will see me in paradise. And this is not some significance that we have attached to the cross afterwards. This was prophesied long before Jesus ever went to the cross. The prophet Isaiah said in the 53rd chapter of his book, verses 5 and 6, He was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace. And with his wounds we are healed. All we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. This is why Jesus died. Every penalty and punishment that should have been meted out for every sin that was ever committed was put on Jesus Christ that day. God did what was necessary to offer pardon for sin. You know as well as I, it is not right or fair to offer pardon to a violent, horrible criminal without the dues having been paid. We get outraged by things like that. We cannot stand the sight of a, of a sinner or an unrighteous man walking free, especially when the guilt is clear. So in order to offer that pardon, which was in his heart, God said, I myself will pay the cost. The Son of God, Jesus, came down and paid it on the cross. Everything that you should have deserved was poured out on Jesus that day. And so now, God offers absolution to anyone who asks. Even you. There is no wrath left to be satisfied. Well, I know that Jesus died for me, but someday your bill's going to come due. Your bill already came due at Calvary. There's no wrath left to be satisfied. There's nothing left to be earned. Look at this thief on this cross. What did he do to earn his salvation? Nothing. All he did was ask to be remembered in the kingdom of Jesus Christ. And that was enough for our Lord. Because all the hard work had already been done. In this story, it was being done. And the thing is, if there was something that needed to be done to earn salvation, you couldn't do it. You couldn't. That's the whole point. Jesus' death did not accomplish 90% of what needed to be done, or 99% of what needed to be done, but all of it. Not in this passage, but later on he will say, it is finished before he passes. We could not earn it. It could only be offered freely by the grace of God. God has determined to save humanity. And all that is left is for us to say, Lord, help me, save me. And Jesus says, that's good enough for me. Because he's already paid the price. Now you've heard this before. But you've probably asked, why would God forgive me? It's a good question. You hear this, the fact that Jesus died for your sins, that he's covered everything you've ever done. And you say, why would God do that? I wouldn't do that. I know myself and I know that it's not right to give me any kind of forgiveness or mercy. Well, in perhaps the most famous verse of the Bible, the Lord tells us why. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. It's right there in John 3, 16. Why would God do this? Because he loves you. He sees you. He sees your life. He saw you when you were a kid, and every one of those moments as a child that turned your life in a different direction. He saw every heartbreak. He saw every decision you made, every false step, every victory, every triumph, every secret thought, every love, every hate, every passion. God sees you. He understands you. The Bible says that the Lord knows our frame. He knows that you're dust. You've said it before. I can't do it, Lord. I'm, I'm just a man. And God goes, I know. Because God made you. He knows you. He cares about you. 
Just like he cared about this thief hanging on the cross next to Jesus. This man was a thief. And he was such a thief that he was worthy of the death penalty in such an excruciating fashion. So what kind of thief was this? And yet here he is being offered forgiveness. Because the Lord knew his name and cared about him and saw his story and saw the things that had driven him to do what he had done. It did not excuse them, but it filled up God's heart with compassion. And he said, I'm going to save this man. And that's what God does for you. He sees you. He sees every moment. Even the things that you keep back from those that you love the most. He sees that. And he gets it. And he says, I'm going to do whatever it takes to save you. And you say, well, why would God do that? Do we not understand that a father loves his children? You're a father. You're a mother. You have a father or a mother. Even if you had a rotten father, you know that he's a rotten father because you know what he should have done. A father loves his children. Even when the children go astray, he never stops loving his children. And you are a child of God created in his own image. And we get so smart and clever. That can't be it. Something so transcendent and mighty and mortal as God could never love someone like me. Well, that all sounds like you're making God out to be great and mighty, but in fact, you're making him out to be too small. Because you, we can love each other. We might even die for one another when we don't deserve it. We see incredible acts of heroism all the time. What makes you think that our righteous God is somehow beyond any of that? He loves you. And you cannot just hold this as an abstract principle in your mind. Yes, the love of God. I'm so glad I serve a God of love and not a God of justice and hate. But it's not enough. You must apply that to your own life. It's not God loves the world. It's not God loves my family or God loves the church. It's not God loves him or her. It's God loves me. And this can be the hardest thing for a person to accept. That God would love you. If you cannot allow God to apply that to your heart, his love for you, like, a, like the best father that ever lived, then none of this will mean anything to you. You'll watch the rest of the church weeping in his presence and lifting their hands and shouting for joy and wondering what the fuss is all about. But once you have encountered the love of God, you can never go back. He loves you and wants to forgive you because he does not want to see you perish. You are not a special exception. We've heard this a lot. You're not some special snowflake. And usually we say that to people who think too highly of themselves. Well, let's turn it around to the people that think too little of themselves. I'm, I'm so far gone, God can never save me. You are not that special. It's a common attitude. The one that despairs of ever being accepted. Maybe you were rejected by a woman or a man at a critical part of your life, and now you have a hard time believing that anyone could want you. Maybe your own father, your own mother didn't love you like they should have. And you have a hard time accepting that. Maybe you've been educated out of the common sensibilities of men. And you don't believe in it anymore. And so you refuse to realize God's love. Maybe you've sinned greatly and it weighs on your conscience. Maybe God has forgiven 999 of your sins, but there's one that you just cannot accept that God would forgive you. And so you stay on the edges. You think you're okay with God, but you're afraid of getting too close. But let me ask you a question. If God can't save you, how could he save Paul? Saul of Tarsus, the persecutor of the church. Saul was on his way to Damascus to drag Christians away to prison and to death, tearing apart families. And God met him on the road to Damascus and saved him and made him the apostle Paul, who wrote most of your New Testament. What about Rahab? Rahab was a woman of Jericho. And God had told the people, Jericho is going to be destroyed. Don't let anyone alive. But the first one they encounter was a prostitute named Rahab. The kind of woman, moms, you would not permit your daughter to associate with. And certainly not your son. And yet she was the one who was spared with all her family when the walls came tumbling down. What about Nikki Cruz, the gangster from New York, the violent man, the drug dealer, the drug addict that God saved 
when David Wilkerson came and preached the gospel to him? What about, I don't have a picture for this one, but what about our friend Pastor Samson in Nepal, who was a possessed alcoholic witch doctor, and God saved him. And now he pastors multiple fellowships and has raised up a godly family, also full of pastors and ministers of the gospel. What about Raul Reese and the Calvary Chapel family? The abusive, murderous husband waiting for his family to come home from church with a shotgun. And then he saw the gospel on TV and was saved in an instant. And now he's pastoring a church and evangelizing all around the world. What about John Newton? A slave ship captain who took slaves from West Africa to the Caribbean and to the United States for years until he was radically transformed and saved, gave his life to the ministry, ended up discipling a man named William Wilberforce who would go on to outlaw the slave trade and writing a song called Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. A wretch like me. Are you a wretch? Maybe you know yourself. Despite the front you put up in front of everybody else, you know who you are. But God came to save wretches just like you. Paul put it this way in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 12 through 16. I thank him who has given me strength, Christ Jesus our Lord, because he judged me faithful, appointing me to his service. Although formerly I was a blasphemer, a persecutor, an insolent opponent, but I received mercy because I had acted ignorantly in unbelief. And the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. This saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance. Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who were to believe in him for eternal life. Paul said, why did God pick me for an apostle? So that there would never be anybody else in the history of the church that would think they were beyond saving. You are not beyond the reach of God's love. And some of you have a hard shell of a heart and a little bit of light is shining in there right now. Yes, this is God speaking to you and saying he loves you. And if this thief on the cross could be saved last minute, then why not you? Why not any of us? Oh, we have such a hard time accepting the love of Jesus. Ask yourself this question. If you could know that God loves you and could forgive you of all the things you've done, how would that change your life if it were true? And then we sigh in our spirit and we think, oh, I'd be able to sleep at night. I'd be able to speak to people at church without feeling like a fraud. I'd be able to read my Bible without being afraid that I'm going to come across a verse that'll condemn me for, to hell forever. I'd run into the arms of God like the prodigal son and I'd never let him go. Well, let me ask you, what's holding you back? Is it old hurts? Somebody who hurt you and maybe told you when you were young, God will never love you if you step out of line and then you did step out of line and you've spent your whole life believing that you're outside of God's love and grace? Is it past guilt? Maybe you did something that is horrible. And maybe no one knows about it but you. But it haunts you. Is it pride? I could never accept such a simple gospel. You need such a simple gospel. Because you are so sinful, a complicated one would be out of your reach. And it could be negative pride. I'm so wicked, God couldn't save me. God is bigger than you. Is it fear? Fear of opening up yourself to God's love because you're afraid that you might get stepped on and betrayed again. Is it old habits? Well, I've just waited too long. It's, it's no, no time for me. This man was dying on a cross, and God thought he had enough time. Let all that go. Their foolishness. They might feel dignified and big and scary and powerful in your mind because you've held on to them for so long, but you need to let go. And receive that love. Die to your oldest self and be born again in Christ Jesus. Do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. Neither the sexually immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, or thieves, nor the greedy, 
nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And you say, wait a minute. We were just talking about forgiveness. Yes. But let me finish reading that passage. Paul says to the Corinthians, and such were some of you. There were people in the Corinthian church who were formerly thieves, drunkards, swindlers, homosexuals, idolaters, adulterers. But he says, you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. God can wash all that away until there's nothing left. It's faith that opens the door. Faith is believing that God is telling the truth when he said, I can forgive you if you'll only ask. Well, I don't understand. You won't understand until you receive it. And then you'll say, why did I wait so long? Right now, today, you can receive the forgiveness of grace of God and begin to experience the love of a good father. Whether you've never come to Jesus before and you've come here as a courtesy, <laughs> The Lord wants to forgive you and save your life. And maybe you've been in the church for a long time and you've put your faith in Jesus Christ, but you've never allowed it to make itself real to your heart. And you're living as if God's trying to keep you at arm's length. God's, God says no more of that. Let me draw you in close. It's not too late. It's never too late with Jesus.